All right, thank you everybody for joining us this morning or this afternoon if you're in Europe, like some of the people watching are. Uh, please open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We've been going through Paul's epistles, going verse by verse, and now we've reached chapter 7. Chapter 7 has more instructions on marriage than I guess probably anywhere else in your Bible, at least in one spot. It's a long chapter, 40 verses, one of Paul's longest. So it's going to take us a while to get through it, especially when you consider... I, when I sent out the email, I think I said, uh, we're going to talk about marriage, what, everything that God wants you to know about marriage, but man doesn't want you to know. And I said that because what this world teaches, and even what churches teach, a lot of times the information in this chapter is not taught by churches, and especially not by the people um, outside of churches. Um, this is all about sex and marriage, really, and what we find here is, basically, you've got, in the world, you've got Satan's lie program, and here you've got God's truth with God's word. And Satan's lies go against the truth. They are put in a framework or make you think it's a form of godliness to make you think that they're teaching something good. Uh, when I was a kid in high school, um, when I, I didn't go to public schools, but I've heard that they were, they were real big on trying to distribute condoms to the high school kids so that they... Uh, had safe sex and you know that was a big campaign that was what in the early 90s I guess late 80s that they were doing that that's not God's message God doesn't distribute condoms in the Bible uh, you know so but yet that was the message that was what the world was saying about sex it's okay as long as you are safe and you have this condom so you don't get this disease and God doesn't address that in the Bible because his focus is on the truth, not on the lies of the devil. And so what we're going to learn in chapter 7 is probably going to be, I'm certainly guarantee it's going to be contrary to what people in the world say. And for the most part, it's probably going to be contrary to what churchianity says as well. Um, I'm not here to please anybody or to make sure I fit doctrine into a certain framework we're just going to believe God's word. As Romans 4 says, let God be true, but every man a liar. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to just read through the verses, find out what they say, and uh, if you've never really studied this in depth, you're probably going to learn a whole lot about what God says about marriage. Uh, the first thing I want to notice, if you go a few verses before, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians 6 and it says in verse 16, now we covered this last time from a spiritual context, but now we're going to look at it from a physical point of view because now he's going to be talking about marriage in chapter 7. So 1 Corinthians 6, 16 says, What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth without the body, I'm sorry, every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So, right away you see from verse 16, it says, Basically, that if you have sex with a prostitute, you are joined to that one. The two, saith he, shall be one flesh. And that's what we see in marriage. When God established marriage in Genesis chapter 2 with Adam and Eve, the two became one flesh. That's what marriage is. Well, that means there is no such thing as casual sex or a uncommitted sexual relationship because the most casual of all would be with a harlot. But if, a, if you become married to a woman, a prostitute, when you have sex with a prostitute, then that means all sex results in marriage. Marriage is the joining of two, where the two become one. In God's eyes, marriage isn't when you stand before a priest or a pastor or whoever or at a court, city hall, whatever it is, 
and agree to spend the rest of your life with this other person. All that does is really formalize um, the commitment. Uh, God says the way God joins two together is through the sexual relationship. I am body, soul, and spirit. My wife is body, soul, and spirit. When we got married, we became one body. And that's a very difficult thing when you have one body, but you've got two different minds. And God made the woman's mind to think differently from the man's mind. And we'll go over that in 1 Corinthians 7. But I wanted you to see that if you become one flesh with a harlot, you are married to the harlot. Then that means that any sexual relationship results is, in God's eyes, is marriage. And then it says down there in verse 17, He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 17. So that's the relationship that we have with God. As God, we are spirits before we were saved. We're dead in trespasses and sins. Once we are saved, God makes our spirits alive in Christ. And we are one spirit with God. Now, there isn't the physical relationship. It's a spiritual relationship. We become just like my spirit was dead in trespasses and sins. And God's spirit, of course, is alive. We're two different spirits. But when I believe the gospel... God makes my spirit alive in Christ, so now I am one spirit with God. I have joined with God in marriage. Not a physical, fleshly thing, but a spiritual thing. That's a very important thing for us to understand. Because if I am going to marry somebody, physically speaking, I become one body with that other person. Well, if I'm already one spirit with the Lord then I want to make sure if I get married to somebody that that person is also one spirit with the Lord. That's why, go down to 1 Corinthians 7, look down in verse uh, 39. This is the only, really the only criteria where God says, you know, if you're looking for a wife, here's what she needs to be. It doesn't say how tall she needs to be, how short, what color her hair, her eyes are, what nationality she is. Um, and none of that. The only criteria he gives right, is right here. In 1 Corinthians 7.39, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. Those four words there. That's uh, all that really God is concerned about, is that when you, if you decide to marry somebody, you need to marry someone who is a fellow believer. Because when you believe the gospel, you become one spirit with the Lord. Then you marry somebody, you become one flesh with that person you marry. It's going to be a whole lot. Now the mind, your mind is different from your wife's mind. And then you're going to have trouble in the flesh as a result of those two minds being different. Well, if your spirit is different, if you're a believer and your wife is an unbeliever... Now you're really going to have a lot of trouble in marriage. Probably won't even stay together. Probably end up in divorce or you know won't be married too long. Because not only do you have the clash of the minds, but now you have the clash of the spirits. You're wanting to do what the Lord says, and she's, her spirit is dead in trespasses and sins, so she wants to do what the flesh says. Or vice versa, you know, the husband could be the unbeliever, the wife could be the believer. Either way, that's why it says, if you're going to marry somebody, make sure they're a believer, just like you are. That's the criteria. But going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, notice what it says, and this is why this is why people don't understand 1 Corinthians 7 today. It's because 1 Corinthians 6, 18 says, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, meaning outside the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. So if I commit fornication... I'm married to my wife. Well, my wife and I are one body. We're one flesh. So then if I commit fornication, now I'm sinning against her. And since we are one body, then I have sinned against my own body. That's what that means. That's the only sin you can do. You know, any sin is bad and separates you from God. But the consequences of the sin is greater when it's a fornication because now you're sinning against your own body. You become one with somebody through sex, and then you become one with somebody else through sex, and then that's a more difficult thing to overcome, because if you're one body with that other person, even though you separate, you get a divorce, or you just 
it was some casual thing, and now you move on to the next person. A part of you stays with that other person, and a part of them stays with you. And so you're just not the same if you sleep around with all these different people. Because, and I think, quite frankly, that's why we are in the mess that we're in today. Why are so many people on drugs? Well, I mean, there is the one to get the high and the good feeling or, or forget about their troubles, that type of thing. But for the most part, it's because there is just so much promiscuity in the sexual arena and they become one with somebody, but it's a casual thing, so they don't recognize it. So then they move on to the next person, and then they move on to the next person, and a part of them is joined with that other person because the two are joined in marriage when they have sex, and the result is now they're not, you know, they need drugs just to cope with life because they've joined themselves with so many people. Look over in Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, it talks about us having the knowledge of God, that God gives us the knowledge of, the etern of His eternal power and Godhead, knowledge of creation. And man doesn't want to retain that knowledge. He wants to be God. And the way that he tries to get away from the knowledge of God is through fornication. Romans chapter 1, it says, verse 19, Romans 1, 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So everybody knows that there is a God and he is worthy of worship. And we should recognize him as God, that we're not God. But man's pride gets in the way and man wants to be God. So you see in verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So how is it the foolish heart, Psalm 14 and Psalm 53 say, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So if I've got a foolish heart, then that means by definition, I have said in my heart, there is no God. I don't want to recognize the Creator as the God of everything, I want to be my God, my own God. So I become vain in my imaginations. I come up with my ideas that are contrary to God's Word. And I say in my heart that there is no God. Now, you know, I may say there's a God. For example, you go to a Catholic, they'll say, well, of course, Jesus is God. We've got Him on the cross here in the church. We take the Eucharist. Um, and so, you know, they'll say that in words. But really, in their heart, Jesus isn't God in their heart because they're following what the church says or what their religion says, the vain imaginations of that church, rather than what God and His Word says. When confronted, we were watching um, the movie on Martin Luther uh, last night. He confronted the Catholic Church and says, well, this is what God's Word says. Indulgences, won't you can't buy your way into heaven. He says, God doesn't sell a seat in heaven or sell a way to get out of purgatory or for your rel dead relatives to get out of purgatory early by the selling of indulgences. And the church kicked him out. You know, they, they wouldn't even, they wouldn't even, he came to the council to try to give the arguments to convince them this is what God's word said. They won't hear it. They were vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. They said that Jesus, they say that Jesus is God. I mean, that's what they taught officially, but in their heart, their hearts were far from God. Because when confronted with the truth of, of indulgences won't get you out of purgatory, they won't listen to it. Because they're vain in their imaginations, their foolish heart was darkened. And how then do they get the idea of God out of their minds? It's through fornication. As you see, you keep going here. Remember, fornication is the only sin you can do against your own body, according to 1 Corinthians 6. So if God has made, we saw in verse 19 of Romans 1, that the invisible things of creation, God has showed it unto us. Verse 20 says we clearly understand those things. So if, I, if God has shown to me who he is and that I need to bow down to him, that I am man, he is God, and the way that I sin against my body is through fornication, then the way I get the idea of God out of my minds and I think that my vain imaginations are okay is 
primarily through fornication, because that's the only sin I can do against my own body. And so it says in verse 24, Romans 1, 24, when it talks about the sins that they do, it says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Well, if, if fornication is the only sin I can do against my own body, then the way that you dishonor your own body between yourselves is by having multiple sexual partners. So I'm dishonoring, I'm sinning against my own body with this one. Then I go to the next one, I sin against my own body there. Then I go to the next one and sin against my own body there. And so I dishonor my own body. By doing so, by becoming one with many other people, then the result is that idea of God. I, the knowledge that I have of God is taken away because now I feel like I am God. It's like the old adage, you know, the teenage boy has the little notches on his bedpost counting the number of women that he's conquered. Well, that's sort of a way that he can feel like he's God because now he is, you know, he is you know, the one in charge there rather than listening to what God says about those things. And so when they have this fornication here in verse 24, verse 25 says, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. Well, that's what I'm doing if I'm getting into fornication. I'm not serving God who says I can only be one with one other person for my entire life and anything else would be fornication. Instead, we're changing it and saying, oh, well, it's okay as long as you wear this condom. You have safe sex. Make sure you, you know, like the rules I mentioned when I was a kid in high school. That's what they were saying, handing out the condoms at the high school, saying, oh, you know, it's fine as long as you don't get a disease. You know, we want to make sure you protect that. Well, we're not protect Spiritually, they're getting a greater disease, and that is the disease of unbelief, where they have this knowledge of God, but because they dishonored themselves among their own bodies, then that knowledge of God slowly gets away. And they change the truth of God into a lie because they've got to come up with justification for why they're doing what they're doing. So they change the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. So instead of giving honor to the creator, instead I'm going after the creature. And then I'm tired of that creature, so then I go to another creature that's more attractive to me. And then when I'm tired of that one, I go to the other creature who's more attractive to me. And after a while, it's not the opposite sex, it's the same sex that's more attractive. Because verse 26 says, For this cause God gave up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, going against nature. People say, oh, I'm, I'm a homosexual because I was born that way. No, it says that the man naturally uses the woman. And the verse 26 says, the women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. God did not make anybody a homosexual. Now, you may have the way you grew up, or you may be predisposed to that sin more so than someone else is, but the natural way that God made it is a man and a woman, not the same sex. So it says in verse 27, Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one towards another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of the error which was meet. Which is what the, the main thing that is unseemly about. It's not that it's just gross and against nature. What's unseemly about the homosexuality is that it's getting that knowledge of God out of your mind. And now you think that you are God. After all, if you start out having multiple partners of the opposite sex, and then you feel like you've conquered that, then you go to multiple partners of the same sex. Well, now you've conquered that. You've conquered all creation, both men and women. So now you're God, in your mind anyway. you got to go to the beast. you got to go to the beast, that's right. And that's what will happen under, um, it's interesting, in the, under the Antichrist. He's called a beast. And the, the whole world wanders after him. Second Peter 2 in the book of Jude calls the unbelievers in the middle of the little flock natural brute beasts. 
We're told that the Antichrist in the book of Daniel, it says that he does not regard the desire of women. So you put all that together, it looks like bestiality is a big thing in the tribulation period. So after verse 27, it says, and verse 28 now, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So you notice, when we started back here in verse 19 and 20, God has shown what we need to know about God to us. Everybody understands He's the Creator. We all understand His eternal power and Godhead. But yet through sexual sin with the opposite sex and then sexual sin with the same sex, the end result is, because we didn't like to retain God in our knowledge, the knowledge of God is completely taken out of that person's mind. He's given over to a reprobate mind. That's why verse 27 says, men with men working with that which is unseemly. What's unseemly is that evolution is true, that there is no God, that we are God. That's unseemly. I mean, that's the fundamental basic truth that everybody knows. You may not be the most moral society compared to some other society. You know, some societies may have a strict legal rules and make sure everybody's towing the line in their society and keeping everything clean and people out of trouble. Other societies are more loose in that. But one thing that everybody knows is there is a God that He has created us. How do I know that? God just told me in Romans 1 that God gave every single person that knowledge. And when you commit sexual sin, specifically the homosexuals here, you work that which is unseemly, getting the knowledge of God out of your mind. And, God's, and that's why it says at the end of verse 27, receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. It was meat. It was fitting that they received the recompense. They received the reward for their error. The reward for their error is a reprobate mind where they don't have God in their knowledge at all. You go into a public school and teach creation, they'll kick you out. You won't even get to teach much of it before they'll kick you out. They'll go, are you crazy? Well, the society as a whole is given over to homosexuality. So it shouldn't be a surprise that the society as a whole has a reprobate mind and won't believe the basics that God has created us and that we need to believe what God tells us or than what man says. And so that's why I say, when we're in 1 Corinthians 7 and it's talking about marriage, you can see how Satan and his policy of evil is all about getting people to commit fornication because that's the only sin you can commit against your own body. The result is, enough of that, down that downward spiral of sin, results in getting God out of your mind completely. God, everybody knows there's a God, but yet every kid out there is told there is no God, and we just go ahead and pay billions of dollars in taxpayer money, because I wouldn't do it if I didn't have to, um, to teach that there is no God, that evolution is true. And somehow that's okay in this civilized society. I mean, common sense tells you there's got to be a God, but yet they don't have common sense because they've gotten rid of it through their fornication. And so since fornication is the way that Satan gets people from the knowledge of God over to a reprobate mind, then it shouldn't surprise us that the ideas out there about marriage and sexual relationships that are taught are completely contrary to God's Word. So we just saw in 1 Corinthians 6 when we started this morning that God defines, says when a man has sex with a harlot, he is one with that harlot. They are married. Our society would think, you tell that to somebody in society, they think you're crazy. They say, well, no, you did something bad. You should maybe go to jail for it. You know, you should get some psychological help, maybe they'd say, but married to the harlot? No, no, that's not true. Because they've got that reprobate mind, or at least they're working toward it. Because they're, they're following Satan's lie program, because Satan's lie program goes according to the lust of the flesh. The idea that sex and marriage are one and the same in God's eyes doesn't help my lust of the flesh at all. And I don't like that. So then you just get rid of that idea. You know, that's why somebody like you had the Seinfeld show, Frasier, other sitcoms that you know, those are the ones I saw, you know, um, 
they would be dating different women. I think they said Seinfeld dated over 70 different women in the entire show. I think Frazier dated over 80. And uh, that's completely acceptable. That's a family type show. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, he can't be with more than one woman at a time, but if he dates one and he's with him two dates and then decides to go on to some other woman with her three or four dates and then goes on to some other woman, in our society, that's fine. But God says, you're joined with a harlot, you're married to her. Look over in Leviticus chapter 22. I'm sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 22. Now, the rules here in Deuteronomy are the rules that God gave a nation, the nation of Israel. And we are not, as Christians, we are not ruling over a nation. We're the body of Christ. Uh, so we can't apply these rules to our society because we're not in the position of governing here on this earth. We are part of God's kingdom, and God's kingdom is not of this world. Satan is the God of this world. But what it shows uh, in reading Deuteronomy 22, it says if God was to have a nation, because he did the nation of Israel, these are the rules that he would have when it comes to sexual relationships. It says, uh, verse 13, Deuteronomy 22, 13, and we'll just... For sake of time, I won't read everything here. But Deuteronomy 22, 13, If any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her and give occasion... And so, basically, this man here takes a wife and he decides, Well, I don't want, I don't want her anymore. I don't like her. So, then he can't just put her away. He's obligated to take care of her for the rest of her life. But then, if she cheated on him, she must be killed. Verse 21. Then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her with stones, that she die. Because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house, so shalt thou put evil away from among you. Basically, under God's law, if a man and a woman have sex and they do not get married, then they are to be killed. That because it's a because sex equals marriage in God's eyes. So if you do that and you don't get married, well then you have to be killed. Why? Well, it says you've got to put the evil away from you. Because if sex is okay outside of marriage, then what that means is now all I can follow the lust of my flesh, and I don't have to follow God. And I can let the lust of the flesh control me. In Ephesians 4 it talks about how the Gentiles, the unbelievers, they work all uncleanness with greediness. And if I separate sex from marriage, then it opens up the opportunity to work all uncleanness with greediness. And that's why a show like Seinfeld or Frasier can be considered a wholesome show, even though over the course of the whole series, they're with 70 or 80 different women and don't get married to any of them. And that's okay, because all they're doing is having fun. But God says... Sex is the joining of the two together in a lifetime commitment. And here, this woman has sex with someone who is not her husband. She's to be killed. we got to stop the evil because if we allow that to happen, then the lust of the flesh will take over. They'll work all uncleanness with greediness. Again, I'm not saying we do this today because we're not a sovereign nation like the nation of Israel. We don't have the ability to create these laws. This is God's laws for Israel. Verse 22 now, Deuteronomy 22, 22. If a man be found lying with a woman married to a husband, then they shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman. So shalt thou put evil away from Israel. Put away evil from Israel. So again, the marriage vow is sacred. Someone is already married to a husband. And now this man sleeps with this married woman. They're both to be killed. We're going to put away the evil. Verse 24, if a damsel... Well, that's a special situation, so we'll go down here. Look down in verse uh, 25. If a man find a betrothed damsel in the field... Well, let's see, that's a betrothed damsel. So again, that's going to be... He'll be uh, killed. And then... Um, Not the, sorry, that's not the verse I was looking for. Um, let's go over to 
Let's try Leviticus. Let's look at the Leviticus passage. Uh, uh, sorry. Is it Leviticus 18.8? Leviticus 18.8. Is it that one? No. Okay. I'm looking for the passage, I think it's in Leviticus, where it says basically that if you have sex with a woman, uh, you are to... Um... Oh, it was in Deuteronomy. I'm sorry. I just didn't look far enough. That you are to marry her is basically what it is. Verse 28. I'm sorry. Deuteronomy 22, 28. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed. So there's the situation where you've got a virgin there. It's not someone who is, um, you know, it's not somebody who is already married. So now you've got two people who aren't married here. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her and lie with her and they be found, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver and she shall be his wife because he hath humbled her. He may not put her away all his days. See, that right there shows you in God's eyes, sex equals mar marriage. So here's a virgin woman who sleeps with this man. Now the man is obligated to take care of her for his entire life or for her entire life. Um, you know, until one of them dies. Sex equals marriage. And if you don't do it, if you don't take care of her, as we saw earlier in Deuteronomy 22, you're to be killed. If the woman cheats on the man, she is to be killed. If the man cheats on the woman, he is to be killed. It's, it shows you the two, when you have sex, the two become one flesh. And that is for life. When you join the two together as one flesh, you can't break that up. And so then you're obligated to stay with that person for the rest of your life. See, that's a, an idea. Again, if, and the way God made it that way is it keeps the lust of the flesh in check. God makes marriage, so you have two people with two different minds together. So that keeps, you are a check on your wife's sin nature, and your wife is a check on your sin nature, because her mind works differently than yours. She enjoys sins that you don't enjoy, and vice versa. So then when you try to do your sins, she tries to stop you. And then when she tries to do her sins, you try to stop her. And that way you keep the sin nature in check. Then when you have kids, sex is related to the having kids and being pregnant. I know today people aren't talking about that because they've separated the reproductive system from sex as well. But uh, that's how God intended it. And so that if you have kids, well, now you've got to train up the child in the way he should go. So now you're going to be a good moral example for your kids. So God created marriage, and He created children, and it was a lifetime thing. It's basically to keep you from getting so steeped in your sin that your wife keeps your sin in check, your sin, you keep her sin in check, and then your kids keep both of your sins in check because you want to be a good example for your kids. Whenever society gets away from that, don't worry about that, whenever society gets away from that, then you end up getting away from the checks in the sin nature and falling into greater sin. That's why we saw in Romans 1. If I'm sleeping with multiple partners and then I go and go with the same sex, then it says God gives them over to a reprobate mind. Sodom and Gomorrah, God destroyed that society. Why? There was no check against the sin nature. Because the, there are three checks that God made against your sin nature. It is uh, your marriage, your spouse is the first one. The second one is family, having kids. And the third one is a nation. Nations have rules. So if a nation says that any sex wherever with whoever is okay, and then I don't have a wife because I'm with the same sex, and if I'm with the same sex, I don't have kids, then all three checks against the sin nature, marriage, family, and nationalism, are taken away. And if all three checks are taken away, then we just work all uncleanness with greediness. And that's why it's when a nation gets to that point that they have to be destroyed. That's why Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by God. 
Jesus says that as it was in the days of Noah and as it was in the days of Sodom, uh, the days of Lot, which is Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The whole world will get to the point where it was like it was in Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's when Jesus says, I got to come back. Nobody else is going to be saved. Matthew 24 says that the deception program of Satan is so strong at the last half of the tribulation period that if he didn't cut it short, no flesh would be saved. And the reason is because all three checks under the Antichrist against your sin nature are taken away. Marriage, family, nationalism. All three are involved in fornication and whatever kind with so-called no consequences. And as a result, no one can be saved in that environment. And since we're getting toward that, that's why we had to bring up Deuteronomy 22. Let's look over in Matthew chapter 19 as well. Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, you've got this question about the Pharisees ask Jesus in Matthew 19, 3. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And Jesus basically tells them, you're missing the point here. Because of the hardness of your hearts, God did allow divorce, but in the beginning it was not so. He says in verse 4, Matthew 19, 4, He answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? I mean, it seems like that's pretty obvious when you look at people out there that there are people who are men, there are people who are women. They think differently, they look differently. But in a society like today, and evidently like where Jesus and his disciples were in, sin was so bad that Jesus has to state the obvious. Um, don't you know that from the beginning God made them male and female? Verse 5, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. They're one flesh. The man leaves his parents... The wife leaves, and they two together are one flesh. They're one body. So if you're one body, verse 6, Wherefore, they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. What's God joined together? It's not by you standing in front of a priest or at city hall and saying, I do, I take this man to be my lawfully wedded husband, or I take this woman to be my lawfully wedded wife, and I'll be with her or be with him forever. That's not God joining you together. That's the state. That's the pastor. Uh, that's your church. That's men doing that. God joined two together through sex. The man leaves his father and mother, cleaves to his wife. They twain shall be one flesh, Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Sex equals marriage. And just like today, that's just some foreign concept to people. Just like if I tell people to go to the kids and say, God created the earth, evolution is false, people think I'm crazy. It's because they don't want to retain God in their minds. And the way they get God out of their minds is through fornication. So then it makes sense that man's teachings about sex would be completely wrong. And so Jesus says, well, verse 8, For the hardness of your hearts, Moses suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Verse 9, Matthew 19, 9, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, again, fornication cuts the, the marriage bond, as we saw back in Deuteronomy 22, if the woman commits fornication against the wife, the man, she's to be put to death. So, whosoever shall put away his wife, except to be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Notice the disciples' reaction in verse 10. His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. The disciples were in an environment in which what God says about sex and marriage was not taught. They did not think sex equaled marriage. I mean, the Pharisees, 
apparently there was a lot of cases where men and women were getting married and the man divorced the woman and went with some other woman. And that was just seen as acceptable. It's the same thing in churchianity today. The church I grew up in taught against divorce and remarriage. It was a sin to remarry somebody else in their, in their, um, in their thoughts. But in the uh, nowadays, are you really going to keep somebody? In other words, you couldn't be a member of the church if you were divorced and remarried. How many people would be members of churches today if we didn't accept someone who was married a second time? How many people would be members of churches if we didn't accept someone who had had sex with more than one person in their life? Very few people. It's just unheard of. Now, again, you know, I'm not saying you can't. You know, I'm just saying the church I grew up in said you can't get divorced and remarried. Again, it says here in verse 9, except to be for fornication, shall marry another committeth adultery. You know, if, you, if you're married and, and you're spouse doesn't want to be with you. I mean, you can't force them. You can't say, oh, well, God says we're married for life. You know, you can't force them. And they go on and they move out and go with someone else. I mean, you can get married again if you want to. It's not going to be a sin. But I'm just saying, you know, ideally speaking, you know, God says sex equals marriage. And that marriage is for life. And so that's why he said in Deuteronomy 22, when you have somebody man has sex with a woman, they got to get married. And if they don't, you kill them. I, you know, because it equals sex equals marriage. And if you don't teach that, then you're going to end up with a society that's like us today. And why there are so many people hooked on all kinds of drugs and they just can't cope with life. They got to go out and get drunk. Most restaurants today, sit down restaurants anyway, um, they'll go bankrupt if they don't serve alcohol. Pretty much all of them serve it. Now, even the, the Cracker Barrel, which is a common restaurant in the South, has started serving alcohol. They never did that before. You can get alcohol with your breakfast now at a Cracker Barrel because they can't survive if they don't serve alcohol because we got to have something to drown away our pain and our sorrow because we've been with so many different people that a piece of me is with that person and then with that person and with that person. And so I'm not a whole person anymore because I've given myself over to other people but I don't have the commitment of a lifetime with them. And so society is all messed up, and it's going to end up in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, and then God, Jesus Christ, is going to come back, and he's just going to destroy it all because they're just steeped in sexual sin, and so they don't have the knowledge of God. So then when someone comes and preaches, you need to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, no one's going to believe it. Because they don't think sin. I don't do any sin. I'm a good person. And who are you to tell me what I'm doing is sin? I'm the controller of my own destiny. I'm God. There is no God. Are you still believe in that God of the Bible? That's crazy. Haven't you heard the Big Bang Theory? Haven't you heard of science? What science tells you? And it, my point is it's all messed up because we don't have the proper understanding of what God says in the Bible that sex equals marriage. If Going back to 1 Corinthians now, if he says in 1 Corinthians 6.16, He which is joined to a harlot is one body, for two saith he shall be one flesh. Then it means you are joined with the other person for life. Now I realize in this society, there's no one accepts that, and you got to have two people together, and of course you could have made mistakes before you are saved, you could have made mistakes after you are saved. I mean, you may have had you know, multiple partners over your life. I'm not here to criticize or look at any of that and know that just like anything else, I mean, all of us do bad things. Um, all of us are liars, cheaters, and stealers, at least in our hearts. Um, some go down those roads a lot harder than other people do. We end up locking them up in prison. Regardless of what you've done, there's forgiveness at the cross. The blood of Christ covers us all when we Trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sin. Past, present, future sins are forgiven. And it doesn't mean God can't use you if you've been involved in things like this. Um, but my point is, I want to get us to or get oriented to what God says about marriage. To understand that. So that we can now understand chapter 7. Paul starts, and the reason we've spent 45 minutes on this, is because churchianity doesn't teach what I just covered in 45 minutes. They won't, they won't go over those scriptures. If they do, they'll take them out of context and 
Oh, no, that was back then. Oh, that doesn't apply to us. And, you know, we're enlightened or whatever. And certainly, unbelievers are not going to teach what we covered in these 45 minutes. But Paul assumes that you already know this when it comes to marriage. So, um, a lot of times today, our society teaches that, oh, I'm going to look... That's why I mentioned the only thing is the qualification. It's not how tall, how good-looking the person is, how athletic they are, how what color their hair is, what color their eyes is. It's 1 Corinthians 7.39 says, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. God is only concerned about who you are inwardly, not what you look like on the outward. But the society's idea is that we look for somebody who is physically attractive and then we fall in love. And then we're with that person and all happy and giddy and joyful while we're with that person. And then when we sort of just fall out of love, then we just move on to the next person. And since there's such a casual thought about this, and it's all based upon feelings and emotions, that's why I showed you, I tried to show you in these 45 minutes how serious God takes sex. That sex equals marriage in God's eyes. And so when you're looking for a spouse or not looking for one, whatever the case may be, you need to understand how God views it. And with that background now, let's go into 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Uh, so, Paul is going to approach this from a spiritual thing. You're not going to hear him say anything like what society says or what church says, where, well, you find somebody good looking, and then you fall in love with them, and then you make sure that they can, you know, got a good job, and they're not doing anything illegal, and you make sure you're in line with how many kids you want to have, or, uh, you know, your life goals are the same, and then you go ahead and get married and have a good time, and then when you decide that you're no longer in tune with each other, well, then you get a divorce and then you find somebody else. That's not how God looks at it. That's all completely physical, lust of the flesh type way of approaching things. What we're going to find in 1 Corinthians 7, it's all about the spiritual. Remember what he said in 1 Corinthians 6, 17. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And if I have sex with somebody, verse 16 says... I become one flesh with them. God, we saw in verse 20, 1 Corinthians 6, 20, ye are bought with a price. Acts 20, verse 28 says that Christ has purchased us with his own blood. So when I am saved, when I believe, my spirit's made alive in Christ and my spirit is one with Christ. I am in a marriage relationship, spiritually speaking, not physically, spiritually speaking, I am married to Christ by my spirit being one with the Lord, joined to the Lord. Christ purchased me with his own blood. Remember what we read in Deuteronomy 22? If a man has sex with a damsel, then he is to marry her. What does he do? He gives 50 shekels of silver to the father's wife. To his, to his wife now, his, not his father's wife, but <laughs> the woman that he's going to marry, her father his new bride's father. He gives her 50 shekels of silver. He bought her with a price. He says, the woman belonged to the father before she was married. Now she's married to the man. Now the woman belongs to the man. So he buys her from her father with the 50 shekels of silver. So too for us, Christ purchased us with his own blood, much more valuable than 50 shekels of silver. That's why he says, 1 Corinthians 6, 20, ye are bought with a price, the price of Christ's blood. So just like the woman who, her husband, paid 50 shekels of silver to the woman's father to purchase her so that she could become his wife, she should then be faithful to him for her entire life because she was bought with a price. 50 shekels of silver. So too, when you believe the gospel, Christ purchases you with his blood. You are now married to him in the spirit. Your spirit's made alive in Christ. You have a spiritual marriage joined to the Lord. He says, 
verse 17 in chapter 6, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. That's marriage, spiritual marriage between you and the Lord. Verse 20 says you are bought with a price, the price of Christ's blood. Therefore, it says, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So if I marry somebody and I become one flesh with them, I'm supposed to honor their body because, and they're supposed to honor my body because we're one body, but at the same time, I'm supposed to glorify God in my body because uh, my body and my spirit belong to God because he's bought me with the price of Christ's blood. So when I look at the issue of marriage, I need to consider my spiritual marriage to God or to Christ first. That is first and foremost. So that's why he says, when he starts off with marriage, he basically says in the first verse, it's good not to get married. He says, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, meaning not to be involved with her sexually. If I am involved with her sexually, then I am married to her. I become one flesh. And so now I've got to deal with, well, I am already bought with Christ's blood, and my body and my spirit belong to Christ. Romans 12, 1 says, I, I, wherefore I beseech you, therefore I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, holy and acceptable. Well, how is it that I can, if I have become one flesh or one body with someone else, and I'm to, to present my body a living sacrifice unto God? It's a lot easier for someone who is not married to do that than it is for someone who is married. Because if I'm married, I'm one flesh with the other person, I've got to make up my mind that I'm going to present my body a living sacrifice to God, and I've got to convince my spouse to do the same thing so that we can both serve the Lord. It could be hard to do. I mean, it's hard enough to convince yourself. I mean, most people out there who say they're serving the Lord are really operating in the flesh in some kind of religion. Um, and you're going to get both people, the husband and the wife, out of that? Uh, again, it could be done, but it's just harder than for one person. Harder for two people to make up their minds. Remember, the woman and the, mind and the man think differently. They have different minds. So I make up my mind to serve the Lord. Now my spouse has to make up her mind to serve the Lord, too. It's a more difficult to get two than to get one. So that's why he starts off. He says, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So when it comes to marriage, the first rule for someone who is a believer is don't get married. Stay single. But then verse 2 says, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. In society, the more godly people are in society, the more you see marriage. You go back a hundred years in this, uh, back in the 1920, um, at least out in the country, the city may be in a little different, but at least out in the country, it was quite common for two people to get married and stay together for their entire lives and not be with anybody else. That was just, the, that was the standard, that was the norm, or at least what was expected of people. You know, maybe they would mess up and commit adultery, but for the most part, they were expected you know, whether if a woman got to be 25 years old 100 years ago and she wasn't married, she's probably considered an old maid by then. You know, she should have been married long before then uh, because she is of the man and they're going to be together for life. And if she gets too old, well, then maybe she won't be able to get married. Um, and then what's she going to do? You know, it's not like today where you just go to college and get some high-paying job and take care of yourself. Back then, women usually had to be married because the men made the money. Women just, even if they wanted to be on their own, it was a lot harder for them to be able to make it on their own than it was for men. And so it was the norm. Now you don't really see that. But yet the society was more God-fearing, more godly back then, a hundred years ago, than it is today. Well, it's because of verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. So, we have God's given us a sexual drive, basically. and um, Now, some less than others, but for the most part, it means that although, ideally speaking, it's best not to get married, the alternative for most people 
is that if they don't get married, they will commit fornication. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to go out and sleep with a bunch of people. Jesus said over in Matthew 5, You have heard it said of them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, He that looketh at a woman with lust in his heart hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Uh, let me just give you the scripture reference so you know I'm not making that up. Um, because in today's society, again, they wouldn't believe that's in the Bible. <laughs> uh, let's see, where is that? Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we've got those who are angry. We've got um, down in verse 27. So Matthew 5, 27 and verse 28 says what I just said there. So when it says in 1 Corinthians 7, that was Matthew 5, 27 and 28. So when it says in 1 Corinthians 7, 2, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. We're not just talking about a physical thing. Because God, remember, you're joined together with God in your spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Verse 20 says, You are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So that means that if it is possible for you to live single, not get married, and not have lust in your heart and commit adultery with someone in your heart, then you should never get married. But most people, although you may be able to get through life with being a virgin your entire life, to actually not have lust in your heart over someone and you're not married, you know, and you stay a physical virgin to do that and in your mind as well uh, most people will not be able to do that which is why although Paul says in verse 1 it is good for a man not to touch a woman he has to qualify that in verse 2 nevertheless to avoid fornication keep in mind that's not just physical but that's spiritual as well that in your mind to avoid lusting after someone in your heart then let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So, we've already got the background that sex equals marriage, and that it's a lifetime commitment. Um, and because your spouse is going to have a different mind than you do, then it's best, if you can, not to get married. But, in most circumstances, you won't be able to do that without committing fornication, at least in your mind. So he says, then you're going to have to get married, basically. And then if you're married, then, verse 3, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. So again, illustrating the concept that when the two get married, they are one flesh. So that means, basically... The way you avoid, you see, you can see the progression here. First, he says in verse 1, stay single if you can. But then verse 2, he says, well, most people don't fall into that gift of celibacy category. And we'll get into that a little later. Um, what that means, the gift of celibacy. Most people are not in that category. Therefore, to avoid fornication, you need to get married. Well, if you're getting married to avoid fornication then what that means is that whenever the husband has his sexual drive going, then the woman needs to have sex with him. And when the woman has her sexual drive going, the man needs to have sex with her. With, yeah, with her. That's basically what verses 3 and 4 say. Because if you don't do that, and you'll see that, like everybody loves Raymond was a sitcom, and you see that all the time. You know, they'd have play little things like that, and they'd say, you know, the, the Deborah would withhold sex from Raymond, and, uh, you know, it was a whole power thing, and it's, you know, just all for laughs and everything. But they did that, and Paul is basically saying here in verses 3 and 4, no, you should not do that. Um, because you got married to avoid fornication, so now you've got a marriage where you're going to be together for life, and you're one body. And so now you need to sacrifice for the other person. And again, that doesn't mean 
you know, if one person has this huge sex drive, it doesn't mean you're going, you know, again, you look in, for example, Ephesians chapter 5, and this is a, a rule when it comes to marriage. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And then verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So, it's not, although Paul says that marriage is basically God's way of dealing with your, your sexual desires in a way that is pleasing to the Lord so that you have the check of marriage, you're married to somebody who has a different mind than you so they can keep your sin nature check and vice versa, and then the result of the sexual relationship, naturally speaking, is kids. So then the kids then keep both of your sin natures in check because you're trying to uh, raise up your kids correctly. Um, since God has made a, that framework then, you need to be in that framework, and if you don't render due benevolence unto your spouse, then the result could be that they will commit fornication at least in their mind. And so then, that's why he says, verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 7, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. But at the same time, remember what Ephesians 5 says. Wives submit unto your husbands, and husbands love your wives. So you don't take this, because you just take this, and from a fleshly perspective, let the lust of the flesh get out of control. Remember, marriage is about reigning in the lust of the flesh. That's why he says in 1 Corinthians 7, 2, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So then verse 3 then, since it's to avoid fornication, then you should have a healthy sexual relationship between the husband and the wife. However, keeping in mind, wives submit to your husbands, husbands love your wives. Um, you may say the women are never told to love their uh, husbands, but that's not true. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, because I've had that thrown up at me before. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Um, where is it? Maybe it's in Titus. Maybe it's in Titus. There is a, a commandment for women to love their husbands. Uh, yes, Titus 2. Sorry, Titus chapter 2. Uh, Titus chapter 2 says in verse 3, Titus 2, 3, The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may be not blasphemed. So, uh, Titus 2.4 commands women to love their husbands, and Ephesians 5.26 commands husbands to love their own wives. So, what that does then, so first you've got to avoid fornication, God has one man and one woman joined together in marriage for life. And that you uh, have a healthy sexual relationship where you're not depriving each other so that you avoid fornication, but at the same time in the framework of husbands loving their wives and wives loving their husbands. So the husband may want to have sex and the wife will say, but I'm not feeling well. You know, I've got... You know, something, you know, my back went out or my, I've been, ate something that doesn't agree with me or, you know, whatever it is. And the husband shouldn't say, well, it says, let the husband render to the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. You know, you don't pull out 1 Corinthians 7, 3 on that, but it's husbands love your wives, wives love your husbands. So love would say, well, I'll forego that until a better time, basically. So... Uh, again, what that does then, it's really the, it's a twofold thing where we keep society running uh, the best it can. First is, you've got marriage, 
between one man and one woman for life. So that you are not joined to somebody and then you don't like them anymore. So then you join yourself to somebody else and now you don't care about them. So you join yourself to somebody else and now you're all messed up and have to take psychological drugs because, and you're bipolar because you've given a piece of yourself to you know, 14 different people out there. And so God has that lust of the flesh put in check by one man with one woman for life. And then you're one with that person and you don't have pieces of you floating out there and other people because you haven't joined yourself sexually with those other people. You're only with one person for life. And then, because husbands love their wives and wives love their husbands, well now, you don't also, in that marriage relationship, you don't give over to the lust of the flesh as well. It's not about me, 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 and what I want to do. It's, oh, my husband isn't feeling well. Well, then we'll just some other time. It's no big deal. You know, I'm not going to go, oh, my lust of my flesh is the most important. So, those twofold approach. Marriage for life, number one, and love between the husband and the wife and the wife and the husband. Those two things are the way God keeps, really, all of society functioning correctly. When those two things are gone, we get further away from God's standard and we get further away from the truth and it eventually leads into Sodom and Gomorrah the whole world being like that and then having to be destroyed at the second coming of Christ. So, those are the two main checks. You know, again, three checks against your sin nature. Marriage, family, and nationalism. So, if you've got the... If you've... Basically, God creates nationalism so that the nations make sure that the rules are correct. So you've got God telling you, this is what sex and marriage is all about. This is what family is about. Then you've got the nation telling you that. So you've got a spiritual guide in your Bible. Then you've got a physical guide in the government, you know, if it's doing what it's supposed to do. And so then when the physical and the spiritual are correct, then the society then should fall in line. And then you have marriage between a man and a woman only. And it's for life. And there's no way of getting out of it once you get married. And then you have kids, and you raise up the children. And that's all three checks against your sin nature. When a society gets away from that, first they get away from God. They don't believe there's a God. They don't believe God's Word, so that's thrown out. So when that's thrown out, then the nation gets away from godly laws. When I was growing up, it was illegal for uh, homosexual, so homosexuals to get married. Today, they can do it. Why? Because this book has been thrown out the window. We don't listen to it anymore. So now, we don't listen to our spiritual guide, God's Word. As a result, society, nations, create rules that are against God's Word. So now we don't have the check of nationalism. So if we don't have the check of nationalism, now we just marry whoever we want, or not get married, or do whatever we want, have kids, don't have kids, whatever. And now all the checks are gone. Nationalism, marriage, and family are gone. And then society eventually becomes like Sodom and Gomorrah, they go down the downward spiral of sin that we've seen in Romans 1, and they end up destroying themselves, and Jesus Christ has to come back and destroy the world. The world is going to be full of rampant homosexuality, and like Lana says, they even get into the bestiality in the Antichrist day. And um, when it gets to that point, they're at a reprobate mind. And if someone's out there who's believed the gospel, you know, like us, we're a bunch of Bible believers out here. We don't believe in that stuff. We believe God and His Word. We take the Bible as our authority. If we go out and share the gospel in an environment that is like that, people aren't going to listen. That's why the two witnesses, look over in Revelation 11, for example. I mean, look at how society is when you get away from the principles of sex and marriage that God provided in His Word. In Revelation chapter 11, for the first half of the tribulation period, God sends two witnesses. Revelation 11 verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. That's three and a half years. thousand two hundred sixty days, three and a half years. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. It's like these are the two olive trees. Olive tree is represented of the Holy Ghost in your Bible. They anointed their head with olive oil. 
in the priestly ceremony because olive oil from the olive tree type of tree of life, the Holy Ghost. It's basically these two people are standing between God and the earth. They're standing there keeping God from destroying the earth right there. Why? Because people won't believe the gospel. They're so hard-hearted. They're given over to reprobate minds. It says in verse 5, And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must be in this manner, he must in this manner be killed. I mentioned last night we were watching the movie of Martin Luther. He translates the Bible into the common language, German, the New Testament anyway. German New Testament. Now we got the Bible in our own language. You would think the Catholic Church would love that, right? I mean, if the Catholic Church is representing God, now everybody can read the Bible. No. They excommunicate the guy. They kick him out. People who follow Satan's lie program, even if it's in a form of godliness, they absolutely hate the truth. So here the tribulation period starts. The whole world is given over to rampant homosexuality, sexual sin, fornication all over the entire world. And now these two men are two witnesses standing before God telling them the truth. Obviously, the first thing man wants to do is get rid of them so they don't have feel bad about what they're doing so that they can keep going on doing the lust of the flesh. So God has to make these two men invincible. You can't kill them. You try to kill them, fire is going to proceed out of their mouth to destroy you. I mean, that's how bad the world has gotten. You know, at least today, if I preach the gospel to some stranger out there, they're probably not going to believe it, but the, there's a very good chance they won't try to kill me. I mean, they may, you know, flip me off or curse me out or do something like that, but they're probably not going to pull out a gun and blow my head off. Probably not. Not yet. Well, they'll take the guns away from everybody so they can't do it anyway. Well, they'll just have to, have to beat me with a baseball bat, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but here you got the two witnesses. I mean, they want to, they're preaching God's word, and man is so corrupt and so evil that man tries to kill him. And so God has to make two men invincible. I mean, that's how bad the world gets. That God says, I'm going to send two witnesses, they're going to prophesy for three and a half years. And people are going to try to kill them, and you can't do it. Once the three and a half years are over, then uh, God does allow the beast, verse 7 says, the beast out of the bottomless pit kills them. And then what, what happens is verse 10, they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Well, the two, prophet, the two witnesses aren't there to make them feel bad or guilty or anything. They're there to show them, you've sinned. Jesus died for your sins. You're in Israel here. You just change your mind. Stop trusting in your own righteousness. Trust in God to save you. Be water baptized. Put yourself under the Mosaic law. I mean, that's good news. The gospel is good news. They gave good news to them. And here they said they were tormenting them. They were tormenting them with good news. That's how bad the world gets. And the reason it gets that bad is because the world is so far removed from these principles in 1 Corinthians 7. So going back there, that's why we had to establish that base that sex equals marriage because people in the society today don't believe that. You go back into the 1800s, most people knew that. They knew the scriptures. They knew at least that point, that part. They knew sex equals marriage. If you were in the country out there, and you slept with uh, the girl down the street there, and you didn't marry her, her brothers would probably come and kill you if you refused to marry her because you, you just did not do that. You did not defile their sister and not take care of her the rest of her life. But today, that's just the norm. Shows you how bad it's gotten. So, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1, it's best not to get married, verse 2, but most people can't do that, so... Have your own spouse, verse 3. Make sure you have a healthy sexual relationship because you're one body. But at the same time, you're going to love each other so you don't try to just follow the lust of your flesh. Verse 5 says, Defraud you not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Uh, that's the one time... 
Uh, we, we talked a few weeks ago we, on the Tuesday night study. We've been going over physical miracles. And we went over the story in Matthew 17 where they couldn't cast, the disciples could not cast out this lunatic devil. And Jesus says, This kind goeth not out but by fasting and prayer. And I mentioned back then that uh, the fasting had to do with the forced fast of the last half of the tribulation period in which if they don't take the mark of the beast, they can't buy or sell. So they can't get food. So if they can't get food, then they... It's not like they're saying, Oh, I'm going to dedicate the lunch period to the Lord. Right now, we're in the season of Lent. It started Wednesday. I went by a church driving home Wednesday. It was a Methodist church. I wish I'd taken a picture. They had on the banner on the, on the outside, you know, the billboard, church billboard. It said, this is exactly what it said. Healing ashes, pancake, 6 p.m. And that was Ash Wednesday, so I knew they were talking about the Ash Wednesday thing. Uh, it's healing ashes, and what's this pancake? And you're doing it at 6 p.m.? I don't know what that's You got that's a problem like. with the food. I don't know, a pancake, maybe a steak and potatoes or some brownies or something, and I'd go, but a pancake? One pancake? Do I get any syrup? I don't know. I don't, I don't think I'd go for that. But the fact that it says healing ashes, we've never seen that before. Yeah, healing ashes. Yeah, what, what are you getting healed of? Ash Wednesday, they put that, they put the ash on their forehead up here. Well, that's where the mark of the beast is going, right there, between the two eyes. Hindus, they have the little red dot. Islam, they have the prayer bumps. They bump their head on the ground to show how pious they are in praying. They keep bowing down, bump their head on the ground so they have a prayer bump. The Jews have their phylacteries, the little box right there. Everybody's got something right there. Why? Because that's considered the third eye. That's considered the seed of Satan. That Satan is that coiled snake in your back goes all the way up and the energy of the coiled snake comes out the third eye. That's why all the religions have that. So it should be a surprise that the mark of the beast is the third eye right between the two eyes there. So if you don't take that, so God says, no, you don't take that mark of the beast. You'll go to hell if you do that because now you're aligning with Satan. It's part of that, that snake, coiled snake. All religions have that, that third eye thing. So it says, you don't take part in that. So then that's a forced fast. So I made the statement back then on our Tuesday night study that the fasting has to do with a forced fast and it's for Israel. It's not for us today. But here we are. 1 Corinthians 7, 5 says, ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. So someone says, oh, see, Paul, he talks about fasting. I believe this is the only verse where Paul mentions fasting in, the, in his epistles. But it's not talking about fasting from food. I mean, obviously the context is fasting from sex. Because verse 3, let the husband render to the wife due benevolence, likewise also the wife unto the husband. And then verse 5 says, defraud you not one the other. So uh, make sure that you have a healthy sexual relationship because that's the way you're going to avoid fornication, except it be with consent for a time. So you get together and decide we're not going to do that. And then instead, we're going to give ourselves to fasting and prayer. So the fasting there is fasting from sex. And the reason is, again, there's that danger of the lust of the flesh getting control. Even in that marriage relationship, even though it's one man and one woman together for life, um, you know, there is the danger that it could just be a physical type thing rather than us, remember 1 Corinthians 6.20, I am to glorify God in my body and in my spirit, which are God's. And so if I just am involved in this physical relationship in marriage, well then, I am maybe getting my focus off of the spiritual. And so that's why it says that you may, as husband and wife, notice that you know we're not reading our Bibles as we should, or we're not using the mind of Christ in situations, because we're given over to the physical, the fleshly considerations, rather than the spiritual. So let's refrain, let's fast from sex for a time, you know, one month, let's say, or, you know, whatever it is. The Lent people, they do 40 days, so you can go out and get your filet of fish from McDonald's on Fridays, which I, I, don't, I, I don't know how eating fish helps you celebrate the resurrection of Christ and not eating meat, but anyway, that's what they're doing. So maybe you want to do a fast from sex with your spouse for a time, and 
you're going to give yourself over. And notice it says, you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. And the prayer, prayer according to Ephesians 6, look at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, this is a definition of prayer. Um, and I mean, you can pray for other people. There is intercessory prayer. There's prayers of thanksgiving. But for the most part, and by the way, Tuesday night, uh, we're going to start talking the three main points that Paul um, tells you how you should pray, our prayer lives and the dispensation of grace. There are three main points, and so we're going to start going over those this Tuesday night. So join us for that. There's a little plug for that. Uh, but Ephesians 6, here's what prayer is about. Verse 17, Ephesians 6, 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Notice there's no period at the end of verse 17. That's why I just kept reading. So you take the Word of God. How do I take the Word of God? I pray always with all prayer and supplication. I pray the Word of God. That's what prayer is. That's why pray without ceasing. Well, obviously that doesn't mean I'm on my knees and close my eyes because I've got to drive. I've got to do my work. You know, I've got to see to eat. You know, I've got, you know, I've got, I can't keep my eyes closed. So praying, pray without ceasing, is a lot like praying always. Same thing. Well, what I do is I take the Word of God. I'm constantly, as I'm going through life, I'm constantly making decisions on what I'm going to do. So then I take God's Word, I mull it over in my mind, and I make a decision on God's Word. And mulling it over in my mind, that's prayer. I'm praying God's Word. And that's how you pray without ceasing. So I can pray while I'm doing my work. Don't have my eyes closed, I'm not on my knees, but I have that mindset of using the mind of Christ in my work. So you go back to 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5, when it says that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. If you want to, you can get on your knees and close your eyes and pray together. You can do that. But primarily what it's saying is, if, I, if we fast from sex for a time period, remember we want to do it um, for a time, and then it says, and come together again, that say, tempt you not for your incontinency. So we're going to set a time. So say, again, we've got the lust of the flesh. They're there. Um, and so we don't want them to take control. So we're going to fast from sex, but at the same time, we don't want to get to the point, remember, back in verse 2, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Well, if I've got my own spouse and then we just don't have sex, well now I'm back to the fornication problem. So he says, if you do, um, you can refrain from sex for a time, set that time period, figure out what it's going to be, and then you give yourselves over to fasting and prayer, meaning you refrain from sex and instead you're going to be praying God's word. And what that does is, instead of you giving over to the lust of the flesh and letting that control you, now you're fasting from the flesh and you're giving yourself over to praying God's Word, the spiritual. Well, I can't pray God's Word unless I know what God's Word is. So you give yourself over to reading God's Word, doing a Bible study. Say, what does that mean? Let's go through Paul's epistles. That's the doctrine for today. Let's see what it means. And let's see how we can apply that in our situations, in our job in our family, with our kids, with our parents, uh, with our uncles and aunts, with our friends. Uh, you know, every situation, how can we apply that? And then our focus then is on the spiritual. But we're only going to do this for a time, that laser sharp focus there, because we don't want Satan to tempt us for our incontinency. So we got to get back to, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So the fasting there in verse 5 is uh, meaning uh, fasting from sex. It's not, I'm not going to eat food. So, And from the context, that should be clear. And then he says in verse 6, But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. So yeah, he's just, going back to verse 1, he says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me. So obviously he must have written and asked him about marriage. And so this isn't God saying, I command you not to get married, but to avoid fornication, 
get married, and make sure you render due benevolence to each other, but you can also, you know, def uh, defraud not one another and refrain from sex for a time and give yourself over to fasting and prayer. All of that, those five verses there, are him speaking by permission. And what's important to understand about that, because a lot of times, the problem when Paul says this is a lot of times, and what churchianity will do, is they'll say, we got to follow the red letters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because that's God himself speaking to us. And Paul, you'll say, well, what about Paul? That's God's word too. Well, no, you see, Paul says, I speak this by permission and out of commandment. When Jesus speaks in the red letters, that's God commanding us. But when Paul speaks, that's just, you can do this if you want, but you don't have to. Therefore, somehow, Paul's epistles are less important than the red letters because this is just Paul speaking and he got permission by the Lord to speak this but he didn't command it so we don't really have to follow Paul first off everything he says in here isn't just his suggestions some he speaks by permission others um, he speaks by commandment so he says in verse 6 I speak this by permission not of commandment you get down to verse 10 he says, And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. So now the Lord's commanding in verse 10. Then in verse 12, But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. Okay, verse 12, it's not him. It's not the Lord speaking. So some of this is a commandment from the Lord, others isn't. Well, how do you know which is which? Well, that's why Paul tells you. So we know verses 1 through 5 is Paul speaking it. And it's not the Lord. But also understand that all of what you have in your Bible here, if, if you've got Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon, all of that is God's Word. All Scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It doesn't say all Scripture is given by inspiration of God except where Paul gave his opinion or where Peter thought he would chime in. It doesn't say that. It says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Well, then what's this idea? Of, then why do you have things like, I speak this by permission and out of commandment? What that has to do with is that God treats us like adults when we're saved. Israel was children. They were unbelievers in the Old Testament. God says, thou shalt, not have, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. These are commandments. God says, this is what you can and cannot do. Specifically, I am commanding you. What we read, you go back to 1 Corinthians 4. Is it 1 Corinthians 4? No, it's 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6.12. Paul says, all things are lawful unto me. In your Old Testament in Exodus 20, God says, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. These are commandments. But today we're not under the law, we're under grace. All things are lawful unto me. Well, why is that? It's the difference between being a child and an adult. When you're a child, you understood as a child, you thought as a child. So because you didn't have this, the maturity to think like an adult, your parents had to command you, this is what you do. 1 Corinthians 13 says, When I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, I'm still going to do a lot of the things that my parents told me to do. I'm not commanded to go to bed at a certain hour, but I voluntarily go to bed at a decent hour because it's a good idea that I not fall asleep at work and lose my job the next day. So I go to bed and get a good amount of sleep. But as an adult, I made the decision on what I do. Spiritually speaking, Israel was children. So God put them under the law. But today, look over in Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4 tells us that in the dispensation of grace, when we believe the gospel, we are no more children, we are adults. Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. 
Even so, we, when we were children, we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So I'm taken out from being under the law, redeemed by the blood of Christ. Now I'm an adult son of God. Verse 6, And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. Remember verse 1. Verse 1 says, As long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant. So in verse 7 says, Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. What it means is when we believe the gospel, God no longer deals with us like children, but he deals with us like adults. So, if I, as a child, want to do something, can I go over to Billy's house and play? I'm going to get a commandment from my parents, you can or cannot go to Billy's house. Now, when I'm an adult, and I want to know, well, can I go over to Billy's house and play? That's a decision I have to make. I could still call my parents and say, hey, can I go over to Billy's house and play? Parents are going to lie, you're, you're 44 years old. Make your own decision. Decide if you, you want to go there or not. I, you know, It's up to you. Don't put this on me. Well, it's because now I'm an adult. I'm mature enough to make my own decision. So I'm not under the law of the parent anymore. I'm mature enough to make my own decision. And that's how it is with Israel. Because they were in unbelief, God says, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. As an adult, I should not do those things either. But all things are lawful unto me, because God says, you're not a child, you're an adult son. And I've put the spirit of my son into your heart. And it doesn't say he has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, obey the Ten Commandments. No, it says, Abba, Father, dear Father. My mind should be based upon what the Father would want me to do. And so I should read God's Word and make my decisions based upon what God's Word says. But if I don't do it, I'm an adult. The decision is up to me. So that's why in 1 Corinthians 7, well, what are the rules for marriage? There's one rule for marriage, and we saw that in 1 Corinthians 7, 39. She is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. So the Lord commands you, as a believer, only marry another believer. Well, should I get married or should I not get married? Should I marry that person or should I marry this other person? Or how tall should they be? What should they look like? How old should they be? God says, I don't care. You're an adult. Make your own decision. And so that's why Paul says, they asked him about, what should we do about marriage? Well, 1 Corinthians 3.3 3 tells us that the Corinthians are carnal. So, if the Corinthians are making decisions about marriage, they're probably not going to make good decisions. As we already saw from 1 Corinthians 5.1, there's a man who is having his father's wife. So you can tell that when it comes to sexual decisions, uh, they're not making good ones. There's a guy having his father's wife, and the whole church is puffed up about it and thinks it's great. So, although they are treated as adults by God, they're to make their own decisions, and God says, just make sure you marry a believer. If you're going to get married, make sure you marry a believer. The rest is up to you. At the same time, we should be using principles of God's Word to make our decisions, and it's obvious that the Corinthians are not using those principles. So what Paul is doing is he's saying, as a mature believer in Christ, as someone who is the apostle of the Gentiles, who has this mystery doctrine committed unto him, he says, I'm going to use those principles as an adult child of God, adult child of God, adult son of God, and I'm going to say, this is how, as members of the body of Christ, you should do. However, you're not under the law, you're under grace, so what I am doing then, I speak this by permission and not of commandment. So rather than that verse there being something to say, oh, well, Paul's epistles aren't as authoritative as Jesus' red letters, and we need to follow Jesus' red letters. Actually, 
the reason you've got that, I speak this by permission and not of commandment, or like in verse 12, to the rest speak I, not the Lord. The reason it's there is to show you that you're an adult. God says you're not under the law, you're under grace. You can make your own decision. However, if you're carnal, you're probably not making the decision correctly. Therefore, Paul says, I'm going to answer your questions and say, this is what I would do as a mature believer in Christ who is considering the spiritual over the physical. Here are some good guidelines to follow. This is what you should do. But keep in mind 2 Corinthians 1.24. 2 Corinthians 1.24 Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. Paul says, I don't have dominion over your faith. I'm not going to tell you, thou shalt not get married, or thou shalt get married. Or, this is who you marry, or, this is who you don't marry. He says, I don't have dominion over your faith. You're not under the law, you're under grace. I'm here to help your joy. And I know that you're carnal. You've got some guy in there having sex with his father's wife. So you're not making good decisions. So I'm going to answer your questions about marriage. I'm going to spend a whole 40 verses on it. But keep in mind, this is just me as a mature believer telling you what I should do. Again, as a child, my parents could say, don't go to Billy's house. Or, yes, you can go to Billy's house. Now that I'm 44 years old, I make that determination. But... If I'm having trouble making that determination, I could call my parents and say, this is what Billy is like. Do you think it'd be okay for me to go over there? Or you think I should stay here? And my parents aren't going to say, thou shalt not go to Billy's house. But they're going to say, well, you know, if it was me, I wouldn't go over there. And here's why. That's basically what Paul is doing. He says, I'm a mature believer in Christ. I know what God's mind is, that we should concentrate on the spiritual rather than the physical. You're carnal, you're not doing these things, so I'm going to give you spiritual advice, but it's up to you. I speak this by permission and out of commandment. All right, we're out of time today. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for the love that you've extended toward us, that in such a world that has fallen away from me, where sexual sin is so prevalent, that you can still save our souls, that we, you can still have Christ living in us, and we can still operate by these principles found in your word, which are so foreign to God's word. Help us to operate in these things, to be a good example, so that others may see the love of Christ coming through us, so that they will want to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.